There are situations where you must depend on public welfare. You've got to have a number. When you run into a problem in the courthouse, you've got to come in with a case number. In fact, even when you die, you've got to have a grave plot number. Numbers. But in the sight of Jesus, I am not a number. I'm somebody. Praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. This is the Breath of Life television broadcast with Pastor Walter L. Pearson, Jr. When God gets ready, He can deliver you. If you call on Him, if you trust in Him, He's worthy of the praise. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, Jesus is worthy. You're supposed to be down flat on your face, but the power of God will lift you up. Tonight we go to the Bible once again to find the powerful Jesus. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think about how powerful Jesus is, I lose my fear for any problem that faces me. That's, that's the consolation that we have. Before we go to the Word of God tonight, we're going to bow our heads once again as we pray. Father in heaven, we open thy word tonight understanding that only the Holy Spirit is able to interpret the Word. For the Holy Spirit has been sent to guide us into all truth. Now tonight, Father, as we open thy Word, somehow hide the speaker so that Jesus can be seen. Let my words evaporate so that the Word of God can be made plain. Let my presence mean nothing so that God's presence can mean everything. And we shall give thanks and praise and honor to thy name. For it is in the sweet and holy name of Jesus that we pray. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Tonight I would ask you to turn with me to the eighth chapter of the book of Luke. And there you will find a story that some people perhaps uh, read without seeing the power. But I believe it's there and I pray by God's grace that you will agree with me before the next few minutes transpire. If I start in verse 43 of Luke chapter 8, I read this. And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude throng thee and press thee, and sayest thou, Who touched me? And Jesus said, Somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. I've entitled our study for this evening, uh, for this occasion, uh, A Woman Named Somebody. The fact is that you can read in the Bible and you will not find the woman's name. She is known by her problem. She is known by her situation. But the Bible doesn't take the time to mention her name. In fact, she is practically anonymous except for the fact that the Bible talks about her problem. She is known, if you please, not by her name, but by her problem. Uh, the Bible says that uh, her illness was one that robbed her of all of her money. Now, folk, let's, let's get real here. No matter what your problem is, if it makes you poor, now you've got another problem. <laughs> there are many Bible scholars who have gone to look at this and have come away saying that the woman may have had this or the other malady. The fact is that her problem was a sensitive one, perhaps one that was connected with her gender and perhaps one that she didn't want to discuss with everybody. I want to take the time to say that when your problem is sensitive, Jesus is sensitive enough not to broadcast it everywhere. In fact, 
when you look at the situation as, as we will do very closely, you will discover that this woman was not given the impression that she ought to go everywhere telling everybody what her problem was. Sometimes the problems that we have are not ones that we want to share. They are private problems. And if I thought that, that God was inclined to put my business in the streets, then I'd be careful how I dealt with God. But I'm so glad tonight that I can tell Jesus all of my problems. And while he is sensitive to help me, he does not blast me everywhere. Amen? Now, of course, there are friends who will let you down in that category. I am uh, careful to say that some people will talk about you now on a telephone that can handle two people at one time. Amen? You got to be careful now. Folks say, I got another call coming through. They may be sharing the very business that you're telling them with somebody while they're talking to you. Excuse themselves every now and then. But this woman's problem was not one that she wanted to share with everybody. Nevertheless, it was a problem that was big enough to take all of her money. No matter whether she was wealthy when she started or whether she was poor, when you have spent all that you have on physicians and have none left, then you've got another problem. Say, if you will, that people are treated the same everywhere, and I will dare to argue with you, for the fact is that when you don't have as much as other people do, there are some folk who look down on you. <laughs> I... <laughs> I read in the Bible about a young man that is called the prodigal son. The Bible says that when he had spent all of his substance, then his friends deserted him. As long as he had money, he had friends. Now some of you understand that that's still true. That if people even think you have money, I found out that if you act like you've got money, you can get some friends. This woman could not put on the pretense anymore. So let's be careful. The first problem that she has is a physical problem. This problem is an unnatural loss of blood that has gone on for 12 years. It's too long a time to have a problem like that. There is no reason to think that she was not weakened by this situation. There's no reason to think that she was not touched in every part of her life by it. But because she had gone from one doctor to another, from one healer to another, after she ran out of the official doctor's offices, we probably ought to imagine that she went to some who were less well thought of. But she grasped for a straw because her problem was causing her to lose virtue in every situation. But now the money is gone. And when your money is gone, you are looked upon differently. If you don't know that, I don't know where you live. I uh, talk often about a day when I was downtown, very city. Found myself downtown waiting for my wife with no money. It's amazing the things that you can't do when you don't have any money. First thing you can't do is park your car. So I drove around and around and around praying that somebody would come out of a parking spot and leave some time on the meter. That's an inconvenience, isn't it? Then when I finally found it, it took me a long time to do that, and when I finally found it, got out of the car, went into a shop, and, and after you've walked around a couple of times in one of these stores, somebody will come up to you and will say with a little urgency, may I help you? What they want to know is, are you just taking up space or did you come here to buy something? It is an inconvenience to be without money. There are places you can't go. There are things that you cannot do. There are places you can't live. There are things you can't wear. There are cars that you cannot drive. You are limited by it. And don't think that because this was long ago, this woman's life was not changed because her money was gone. But, but it gets deeper than that. The woman was not only considered less than she was before because her money was gone, but in those days there were laws called ceremonial laws, one of which said that if you have an abnormal loss of blood, that you are considered unclean 
not only for the duration of the time that you have the malady, but for seven days thereafter, and therefore you are excluded from public worship. Now, folks, if you've got a problem, how many know the place you need to be is in God's house? There is joy in the house of God, even if you're flat broke. The fact is that man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. You may go down to your local bank and they may look down on you, but God does not judge us by the credit cards that fall out of our wallets. Amen. He does not judge us by the money we have in savings accounts. God does not judge us by the money that we have amassed. He looks at another level. So for God's sake, if you, if you run into a problem, you want to be able to go in God's house. But because of these rules, these laws, she's looked down upon by some people because she has no money, and now she can't go to church. But it, it, it was a little more acute than that because this uncleanness was considered to be infectious in nature. It was contagious so that if I were seen with someone with this problem, I then would become unclean also. Now, I know some folk who will treat you like that now. We, we don't have those kinds of rules anymore. But it's amazing. Some folk, as long as everybody is saying, praise God for you, they'll be your friend. But then when everybody turns on you, there are some folk who go across the street and greet you that way. They always got to run. Huh? You call them up. You used to talk a long time. But now the word is out that you are not what they thought you were. And friends of mine, let's, let's be honest with each other. None of us tonight, none of us on this occasion can claim perfection except in Jesus. So, so we ought not ever get to the place where we actually look down on another human being. Uh, God's children are not to be judged in that fashion. But this woman now is put in a situation where she can't go to church, but, but, but if they see her on the street, they've got to be kind of careful. How you doing? Good to see you. And then you've got to move on. Now, now, count with me if you will. The woman has the illness that was like a pebble dropped in the water of her life and its ripples began to spread. Because of the illness that has taken some of her strength and vitality, now she's poor. She's poor and now she is excluded from worship. She's excluded from worship, but more than that, her circle of friends begins to dwindle because if you get close to her, you become unclean. I don't know about you, but I think this lady's got a problem. And the question is, what do you do when you've got a problem that nobody seems to be able to solve? What do you do when you can't go to the source, when you can't go to the house of God? What do you do when the people who ought to be on your side turn against you? What do you do when the doctors at the 16th hole of the golf course have gotten together and discussed your case and have determined that either you have some psychosomatic illness or it's genetic in nature and they don't want you to visit their offices anymore? What do you do when you cannot go to your friends who were long friends, long-standing friends, what do you do when you seem forsaken? What do you do when the medical establishment treats you like nobody? When the church treats you like nobody? What do you do when your friends treat you like you don't exist? What do you do when you are forsaken by everybody? My answer is simple. You go to somebody who's got the power. And I suggest to you tonight that Jesus has got the power. Jesus can handle my central problem. Jesus can handle my central problem so that all the other problems that have come ringing away from it are taken care of too. He's got the power. That's why I preach Jesus. I preach him because he's got power. I, I have read some uh, theological uh, uh, assessments that say that it is some European construct that gives us this strange new Jesus, this Jesus who is an influence 
meandering through the mist of nowhere. This wandering Jesus, this influence that is not a personality, I don't understand that because that's not the kind of Jesus who I've met on the pages of the Bible. I have met me a Jesus with power. In fact, if I read Isaiah 53 correctly, uh, I, I learned that Jesus did not come with any form or comeliness that we might desire him. I believe that God could have sent Jesus here so handsome that every woman would have fallen in love with him and so muscular that every man would have adored him. But God chose not to make it so. He chose to make it so that his power was not the power of the look of his face or the power of the ripple of his muscles. It was a power that was greater than that power that emanated from his soul, a power that shone through his eyes, a power that was based on something, not just a feeling, but based on the fact that Jesus was indeed the Son of God in human flesh, that he came to this earth to light up our lives again when sin had turned the lights off. Isaiah 59 says that when you got a, had a problem, your sin separated between you and your God. But God's hand is not shortened that it cannot reach, and his ear is not heavy that he cannot hear. God will not be disconnected from us. And so in the fullness of time, he sent Jesus to bring us back to him. And Jesus, because he is God and man at the same time, took hold of God with his divinity, took hold of man with his humanity, and pulled us together in him. So tonight, I bring you a powerful Jesus. Well, if he's that powerful, why then is this woman still sick? Well, in a minute, you're about to find out that she's not going to be sick long. She said, I've run out of money. I've run out of friends. I'm down now to the place where the doctors don't want to see me. My bills have not been paid. I don't know whether there was insurance in those days. I doubt it seriously. You ran out of money then, that was it. So now where do I go? This woman proposes in her mind. She says, I don't want to discuss my problem everywhere. <laughs> I don't want to let my business out in the street. In fact, what I want to do is just find Jesus somewhere, and if I could just touch him. I don't have to have a talk with him. I don't have to have some grand dialogue with Jesus. You know, some of us love the Lord, but we, we will only come if we can come our own way. <laughs> We've got to have some grand occasion to come to Jesus. Let me tell you, when your situation gets bad enough, you don't need an occasion. You can slip to Jesus. And this woman said, if I could just put my hand on his clothing, I believe that, that I might be able to get me a blessing without him even recognizing that it was gone. For I believe that he's not an ordinary man. I believe that there is power in this Jesus. I believe that he has not come representing himself, but there's power from God in him. And if I could just touch him, just touch him. If I could just touch his clothes. So now this little weak woman, she cannot be too large and framed now. She must have wasted away during these 12 years. But with her little frail, frail frame, she starts to find, where has Jesus been? And when she discovers that he's been somewhere that's not too far away, she follows his trail until she finally gets to a place. One of my favorite writers says that this woman did not have enough strength to plan her way to Jesus. She probably could not even do like Zacchaeus and go up into a sycamore tree. All she could do was just to follow with hope in her heart. But the writer says that that Jesus was moving one way and somehow he turned and started coming back her way. I don't know about you, but I recognize that in my life, it was not me who found Jesus. It was Jesus who found me. If I had had to find him, I don't know where I'd be tonight. But the fact is that Jesus looked down into my excuse for a life and knew that he could make something of me. It was not me who pursued him. It was Jesus 
who pursued me. And, and, and now this woman finds herself in a strange situation because the very thing that she's hoped for is now coming to pass. And as Jesus begins to move, you know how the crowds move. Some people are just around to be in the crowd. <laughs> you know what's amazing to me? I believe that somebody else in that crowd was sick. I believe somebody brushed up against Jesus. I believe somebody with a disease that was more serious than this woman probably brushed up against Jesus. My question is simple, why didn't they get healed? You know, you, you can't just brush, it can't just be passing like ships in the night. There has to be some intentionality in your touch. Without faith, the Bible says, it's impossible to please. You gotta have faith. And so this woman gathers up all of the faith that's in her life. And, and when she sees him coming, I don't know whether she had enough power to maintain her spot. She may now be pushed along by the crowd, but she is so determined that she'll do anything now, and she presses her way close enough to reach down to the hem of his garment. And when her hand touches him, I don't know what she must have felt, but she knew that she was healed. She knew she was healed. <laughs> Forgive me, but I've done a little digging into that, uh, that moment. It's, a, it's, it's an electric moment. If you were a part of that society as Jesus was, if you were part of the Hebrew nation as Jesus was, you wore at the border of your garment a blue fringe. <laughs> I like this kind of stuff. I get excited. Excuse me. The blue fringe represented your determination to do what God commanded. It was an acknowledgement that you were not just anybody, but that you were one who had decided that you would do whatever God said to do. You recognized that you were part of a peculiar nation. You recognized that you were called by God to do certain things. Isn't it time, my friends, for somebody in this strange time in which we live to, to, to identify themselves not with a blue border, but simply by obeying whatever God says to do? It's time for people to start obeying what God says. Well, this, this blue border represented that decision to obey. It was a symbol of faithfulness, if you please. So now, would you allow me homiletic privilege? Would you allow me to suggest that when this woman gathers up all of her faith in one touch and then reaches down to the fringe of the garment, that what she probably touched was the blue fringe that represented Jesus' faithfulness to God. So her faith touched his faithfulness. Faith touching faith. God was the father of all. Jesus acknowledged the power of God. And the blue fringe around his garment was testimony that while he was God in human flesh, he was willing to do what God said. And so now this woman reaches out to touch the blue fringe and has her faith, touches that faithfulness, something happens. There's an immediate change. Now you tell me that's not power. I, I have no problem with, with some of the things that I see people doing in order to gain favor with God. I somehow think that we don't need to worry so much about gaining favor in Christ, we have access to God. What we ought to learn really to do is simply to believe enough to reach out, to touch Jesus. Jesus passes by all the time, doesn't he? He walks through our lives, and, and if our faith were sufficient to touch his faithfulness, that could be a change. This woman reaches out and touches. Now, wonderful to watch human drama. Some people don't believe that the Bible is so real. They, they put it so far away and, and, and they make it so sanitized. The sanitized version of the gospel. I dislike it. I believe that Jesus came in the midst of human affairs. I believe that his power is efficacious 
in the middle of things that are jostling against each other. Jesus didn't have to take us out of ourselves for his power to work. The power of Jesus is effective where we are. So in the hustle and bustle of society, Jesus is still effective. His power is, is sufficient in the middle of all of this. So Jesus says, somebody touched me. <laughs> Remember now, the woman has been treated by the medical establishment like nobody. She's been treated by the church like nobody. She's been treated by her friends like nobody. In fact, every day of her life, there was a litany of voices that confirmed you are nobody. You're nothing. But now Jesus says, somebody. So now this woman reaches out to touch the blue fringe and has her faith, touches that faithfulness. Something happens. There's an immediate change. Now you tell me that's not power. I, I have no problem with, with some of the things that I see people doing in order to gain favor with God. I somehow think that we don't need to worry so much about gaining favor. In Christ, we have access to God. What we ought to learn really to do is simply to believe enough to reach out to touch Jesus. Jesus passes by all the time, doesn't he? He walks through our lives and, and if our faith were sufficient to touch his faithfulness, that could be a change. This woman reaches out and touches. Now, it's wonderful to watch the human drama. Some people don't believe that the Bible is so real. They, they put it so far away and, and, and they make it so sanitized the sanitized version of the gospel. I dislike it. I believe that Jesus came in the midst of human affairs. I believe that his power is efficacious in the middle of things that are jostling against each other. Jesus didn't have to take us out of ourselves for his power to work. The power of Jesus is effective where we are. So in the hustle and bustle of society, Jesus is still effective. His power is, is sufficient in the middle of all of this. So Jesus says, somebody touched me. <laughs> Remember now, the woman has been treated by the medical establishment like nobody. She's been treated by the church like nobody. She's been treated by her friends like nobody. In fact, every day of her life, there was a litany of voices that confirmed you are nobody. You're nothing. But now Jesus says, somebody, somebody touched me. <laughs> you know, you're not really somebody until Jesus says so. <laughs> I don't care what you may possess. I don't care where you live or what you drive. Until Jesus says you're somebody, you're not somebody. Jesus turned the tables around and declared, you are somebody. And I suggest to you tonight that we live in a generation, some of our children feel like they are nobody. This society of ours is me. It will chew you up and spit you out. It will crunch you down into a number. There are so many places where we are turned from human beings into numbers. You go into most hospitals without an insurance card and see how you feel. Uh, your insurance. Well, I have it. No, no, no. Do you have your card? What is your insurance number? I don't care what your name is. You got to have a number here. Huh? Do you know it's true? There are situations where you must depend on public welfare. You've got to have a number. When you run into a problem in the courthouse, you've got to come in with a case number. In fact, even when you die, you've got to have a grave plot number. Numbers. But in the sight of Jesus, I am not a number. I'm somebody with Jesus. So I don't care what everybody else says. In the power of Christ, I take on personhood. 
Some of our young people need to understand that it is not the concoctions of, of modern society that make you somebody. We, we are all now in this, in this new age. It is the postmodern era when we have come out of the feeling that possessions make you somebody. When I was a child, he who had the most toys won. You know. Now some of us are old enough to still be caught up in that obs obsession. And so we, we gather things. It's keeping up with the Joneses, whoever they are. And you've got to make sure that if they get something, you get something. They get new furniture, you get new furniture. Come on now. Huh? They get uh, a refrigerator that's uh, green, and now you've got to get one that's black and you can't put fingerprints on it. They get a big screen television, you've got to get one that covers the wall. They get a little rug that rolls through the house, you've got to get wall-to-wall -wall carpet so thick that your shoes disappear when you step in it. That obsession was in the modern era. Now we have come to the postmodern era when information is key. So if you want to impress your friends, you say, today I was on the internet. Huh? <laughs> and you know good and well, you may have been on the internet, but you were as lost as you could have been. You can waste more time on the internet than any other place I know if you don't know what you're looking for. But information is king. I've got a personal computer. And I'll tell you, my, my wife accuses me often of being part of it. I, I'm looking for a smaller computer, you know. I met a friend of mine the other day, I'm talking about keeping up with the Joneses, and he's got a computer that's smaller than mine. And he came in, you know, and opened his little case, pulled it out. He said, you see, I can access the internet now on this. And I looked back at my big computer and I said, oh, that's terrible. Now I got to go out and get me a bigger computer so that not only will I say I've been on the internet, but I've been on the internet with a smaller computer. Folk, let me tell you something. You can spend all day on the internet, but when you shut down your personal computer, your heart will still need Jesus. The problem with our world now is that we have so much information. Information surrounds us. We've got so many choices that we don't know what to do. When in fact, the only choice that you need to make is to turn your life over to a Jesus who's powerful enough to control everything. For the power of God is greater than the internet, greater than the power of some interconnected web. God is in fact so powerful that he can be in contact with you with the smallest transponder that you can imagine. Don't get me started. I remember when I got my first cell phone, it was like a brick, big thing. Put it up, you, come on, you, some of you folks still have those. And then I saw somebody with a smaller one. And I got that one, you know, you put it up here and then I got one you could flip open and you put it, you know, and then I saw somebody one day the other day with, with one so small and going like that. And I said, oh, I got to get me one of those. Man told me on the plane the other day, it's not going to be long before they have something in the size of a watch and you'll be able to just, but I, I, let me tell you a little secret. Do you know I can, standing right here, you can't even see my transponder. But I can have a little talk with Jesus. I don't need a flip phone. I don't need a cell phone. I don't need a small, any watch looking. I don't need anything. I got a telephone in my bosom, the old folk used to say. And I can ring it up from my heart. You don't need to pay a bill. Jesus paid the bill at Calvary. Your long distance fees have already been cared for. And all you got to do is call it. If you believe it, can I hear you say amen? This woman touches the hem of his garment and thinks that Jesus doesn't know. How are you going to get all that kind of power, faith, touching faith, and Jesus doesn't know? If Jesus had kept on going, I would have been disappointed. I said, what does it take? I mean, is Jesus so insensitive that a woman could be healed and he not know it? So Jesus says, look, somebody touch me. Peter is the one who usually talks. Jesus, uh, there's a crowd around you. 
certainly somebody touched you. People have been touching you all day, Jesus. He said, well, you don't understand. Don't, don't, don't talk that way. You, you, you're not on my wavelength. Somebody touched me with a different touch. I felt some power leave me. Now, he did not say that as though he were disturbed that the power left him. In fact, the reason why Jesus came to the world was so that he could dispense power. I am come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus came so that the blind might see and the deaf might hear. Jesus came so the discouraged might take hope. He wasn't disturbed. He just said, I know one thing, some power left. I said, well, Lord, the people are everywhere. He said, no, no, no. And he begins to look now. And the little lady, not wanting to discuss her problem, all she wants to do now, she got her blessing. No, no, no. I don't need to talk. Y'all just go on with what you're doing. I'm going home now. Let's see how they're going to treat me in seven days. Because this plan is working for me. My blood is no longer oozing from my body. I'm healed by the power of Jesus. All I got now is seven days to freedom. Going down to church and have me a hallelujah good time. Huh? But Jesus isn't through yet. When he, when he heals, he heals completely. <laughs> That's the power of Jesus. This woman's problem was not only that she was sick, her problem was not only that she had been impoverished, but she didn't have any friends. Can you imagine what it is not to have anybody talk to for that long? You must think of a lot of things that you'd like to say. And it's a fact that the association with other Christians, in fact, let me broaden that because sometimes we get so narrow in our definitions that if we don't think somebody is a Christian, we don't want to associate with them. Well, the fact is that all of us were either lost or we're still lost. And, and if we are found, it's not because of our power, it, it's the power of Jesus. We, we probably ought to understand that everybody is a child of the King and learn how to love each other more. But, but somebody must have thought, well, this woman, she needs to associate with some folks. She needs to talk a little bit because she may have even come to the place like I do sometimes. I'm getting kind of old now. I'll, I'll talk to myself if nobody's around. Huh? They used to say that there was something wrong with you, but one man explained to me the other day that it's okay if you talk to yourself. It's even okay if you answer as long as you don't argue. Huh? This woman needed to talk to somebody. Let me tell you something. There is power in association. Bible says the writer to the Hebrews talking, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You ought to come together to provoke each other to good works. You ought not come together to pull each other down, but you ought to come to God's house to say something to uplift somebody. In fact, every one of us have something bad to say about what happened this week. Why instead don't you say what good happened this week? Tell somebody that Jesus has blessed you. Amen. We've gotten so sophisticated now until we don't want to take the time to talk about waking up in the morning. <laughs> My grandfather used to be able to pray those wonderful, loquacious prayers. My brother and I would sit and listen to him. We could not believe that his rhetoric was so beautiful. And he would say, well, you know, uh, you'll know now who I've been around, but he would say, Lord, I thank you that you woke me up this morning clothed in my right mind with the activity of my limbs. Well, you folk are too sophisticated to pray like that, I understand. And then he'd say, Lord, I thank you that uh, when I woke up, the, the four walls of my room were not the narrow channel of my grave and my couch was not my cooling bowl. You don't even understand that. What granddaddy was saying is that I know that when I woke up this morning, it wasn't me, it was Jesus. If you think that your alarm clock woke you up this morning, take one down to a funeral home. 
it is Jesus. In him we live and move and have our being. Are you still with me? So if you've got a backache, you ought to thank God that you've got a back to ache. Huh? If your feet hurt, you ought to thank God you've got feet to hurt. And if you've got a headache, you sure ought to thank God you've got a head to have an ache in. Some people would love to have a headache. We've got to learn how to pray and, and thank God. There is power in sharing the blessings of God. You ought to keep a little blessing tucked away when you see somebody looking like they're not going to make it. Tell them you know they're going to make it because the Lord just blessed you. And that song says it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, <laughs> he'll do for you. Jesus said, lady, you, you over there. Say, say, come here, come here, dear. You, you, you touched me, didn't you? Would you, would you come here? I, I, I want you to, to, to share with these folks what happened to you. See, that's power in sharing your blessings. And all of a sudden, this woman who hasn't been able to talk to many people for the longest gets up and says, you know something? <laughs> a minute ago, I thought I wasn't going to make it. I was so weak that I could barely get into this crowd. But I just somehow felt that if I could touch the hem of <laughs> Jesus' garment, that everything would be all right. And I want you to know that when I put my faith in my touch and when I put, oh, you should have felt what I felt. Somebody in the audience probably said, well, you know, that's something, isn't it? I've been walking around here with all these problems and I didn't even think to have that kind of faith. And here's a woman who is telling now that there is a book that is written by Dr. David Sobel. Dr. Sobel says, out of all the other factors that build up your immune system, you need to know that I've been reading a little bit, exercise, diet, health care, out of all the factors that build up your immune system, the highest one is socialization. Socialization is simply getting along with people, having friends and sharing positive communication with them. It builds up your immune system. Now forgive me, you know, every now and then my imagination gets baptized and set free. I believe in my heart that not only did Jesus want to heal her for now, but he wanted to give her an experience to reconnect her with society so that her immune system could be built up so she would not fall again into a situation like she was in. I believe that when Jesus heals you, he not only heals you of your instant problem, but he makes a change in you so that you are not disposed to fall back into that situation. Friends of mine, it is this powerful Jesus who I give to you tonight. Power by itself would almost be beyond reason without the caring that Jesus has. To think that God could arrange it so that a woman who had almost run out of strength could find herself confronted by the very one who had the very thing that she needed. To think that with one touch, her faith coming in contact with the representation of Jesus' determination to obey his Father. Her faith touching his faithfulness could cause power to surge into her life. Not only changing her physical condition, but changing many other things about her. And when you think about where we are in this strange world in which we live, Anonymous, lost, nobody. But in Christ, there is identity. You may live in an apartment all by yourself. Your relatives may have stopped dropping by. But Jesus still knows where you live. You, you, you may be a single mother taking care of your children. 
The court system can't even make the money flow where it's supposed to flow. And you may think because your former mate has given up on you that there is no hope, but Jesus knows what your problems are. Jesus understands your needs. You are not a number to him. You may be a man seeking companionship. You know, in this society, it's strange. We have all kinds of mechanisms to bring, mechanisms to bring people together when, when in fact, the magnetism of Christ is probably the most trustworthy. If you are in contact with Jesus and you meet somebody else who's in contact with Jesus, there ought to be a little, little, little consonance there. Amen? In fact, if we stop trusting in looks so much, and start trusting in the power of Jesus, you would be able to determine with more surety who it is that God has for you. So sister, instead of looking for the man whose suit looks the best or whose car is the newest, why don't you find the man who loves Jesus the most? Why don't you let the Jesus in him reach out to the Jesus in you? Trust that connection. It's more reliable. But whatever your need is, the fact is that the powerful Jesus has a supply. And tonight I want to suggest to us that we stop trusting in externals and peripherals and, and things that are trivial and don't matter. So you got a computer, so what? 18 months after you buy it, it's obsolete. Go down to get a part for it and they'll tell you it'll be quicker for you to buy a new one than to fix the one you've got. But I want to tell you, I want to remind you about a connection that doesn't become obsolete. When you call Jesus, you can call him on the same line that you used 10 years ago and it still reaches. You don't have to go in and get a new system. All you've got to do is stay in touch on your knees. Stay in touch while you're driving. Stay in touch while you're riding the bus. Stay in touch while you're on the train. Stay in touch while you're at work. Stay in touch in your family. Stay in touch when you're with your boss. Stay in touch wherever you are. And you'll learn that you can call Jesus from anywhere. Tonight, this powerful Jesus, the one that we ought to be lifting before our children, when young people are striving to make something of themselves, we ought to let them know that the answer to success is Jesus who holds the world in the palm of his hand. While they're out chasing some dream that will never come to fruition, they ought to be somewhere trying to find Jesus for in his grasp there is success. There is everything you could dream of and things that you could not imagine that could be. They are in the hands of a Jesus who loves us, who is not only powerful, but who is caring. Tonight, I recommend this Jesus. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Father, in a world gone mad, in a world that strips us of our power and makes us feel impotent, in a world that talks of empowerment but ceases to empower. Help us to know that our power source is not found in this world, but the source of our power should be Jesus. And tonight we don't need a decoder. We don't need some special system. All we need is to ask, to invite, to open the doors of our heart. And this Jesus will walk into our lives and make a difference for us. Father, we are grateful for the power of prayer, the connection that we have tonight through Christ to the throne of God. And we are grateful that our prayer has been heard and that answers are on the way. In the name of Jesus, amen.